microphone we had two microphones at one time who has the second microphone that from the previous call okay you know what who has the second microphone that y'all just had up in the previous talk where did it go um, guys we have a problem here if we okay we at least have two all right, guys, would somebody uh, actually take this microphone and we'll have to pass it? I'm not, not ideal. Has anyone ever seen Gigi Allen? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we can't. We, can, we may have to do what we have to do. Okay. Uh, All right, guys, we have to sign the poster down to speak with Betty Boom later on. That includes me. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to give a quick intro to what this panel is supposed to be. Uh, originally, when we were planning this thing out, I can't remember who actually wrote this particular abstract, but it was um, a pretty nifty one. You, you wrote this abstract. I wrote it? Yes. Kind of figures. So let me see if I can pull that abstract up real quick, assuming things didn't freeze. What was that? All right, the abstract was a university education and security. Is it right for you? And what does university education and security even mean? Is the security education the proverbial locked door to a hacker's success? And if it is, what is the bump key, shim, pick, or high explosive to open that door? I don't think I wrote this. Completely, at least. A you panel wrote of middle aged white males me middle-aged, uh, who expressly disavow any relevant expertise will discuss the advantages, issues, and possible reasons you may or may not want to engage in an overpriced long-term commitment. What are the benefits, risks, and pitfalls of a university education for the hacker? Is there a meaningful difference between education and training? What is the role of certification and accreditation? Arguments against education for hackers have just as much bias as arguments for it. And these pale in comparison to the arguments for and against hackers of hacking of education, which may or may not be discussed by this panel. Long term, what is the direction of information security and system security education for the hacker community? I also have some suggested questions. We're going to take questions from the audience on this too. Unfortunately, we have to pass this microphone back and forth because this thing ain't going ain't going anywhere. I'll play Bill Donahue. Does anybody actually, actually put the questions that I sent out as beginning ones? Yes. Someone pull that up because that's going to help out a lot because I don't have, I can't carry this and walk around. But let's introduce ourselves first of all. I'm Adrian Crenshaw, uh, Masters in Security Informatics from uh, IU Bloomington. Thank you for that information. I'm Bill Gardner and uh, I teach inf digital forensics and information insurance at Marshall University. I uh, actually have degrees in political science and journalism. Uh, I'm an OSCP, and I'm also a Libra. Thank you. <laughs> That's scary. I'm a Libra, too. <laughs> what would you like? Hook up. <laughs> uh, my name is Ray Davidson. I have taught networking and security at Purdue. I worked with, you got, some of you have heard of SANS. I helped with their accredi recent accreditation, so if you want a master's degree, go to the SANS Technology Institute. Uh, my training is actually not in computer security either. I have a PhD in chemical engineering, which, you know, is, is actually more relevant than you would think, and we'll get to that. I'm uh, Sam Lyles. Uh, I like uh, long walks on beaches. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I teach at a little university in the middle of a cornfield called Purdue. Uh, we have a little program called Sirius there, which is a center of excellence in research and information and security, which is a long name to say that we do a lot of technical stuff. Uh, I am in the Cyber Forensics Laboratory, and since I don't have anything to drink here, I can say cyber all I want. And I, I would say that... <laughs> And, and then I would say that uh, there's a couple other things. I actually have a doctorate in digital forensics. Okay, so that's kind of a, a different way of taking it. So there's some other things to talk about later. 
My name is Nathaniel Husted. I just finished getting a PhD at Indiana University in security informatics. And I'm still sticking around there uh, to help out with some of the curriculum development as I've also transitioned from academia to industry. And to, for our Purdue friends, they will be happy to know my undergraduate actually was a Purdue University undergraduate. <laughs> I, I am not from uh, Purdue, or and I've never been to Indiana. Although I'm considering walking across the bridge later tonight. So, uh, <laughs> I, I'm Rob Jorgensen. I'm from Utah Valley University. Uh, I'm actually doing the opposite transition. I'm transitioning from industry uh, to academia. I was hired under a three million dollar Department of Labor grant to build a cybersecurity program at UVU. Uh, my academic background is I have a master's in information systems. My undergraduate work was in business management and behavioral science. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of certifications, and uh, I'm not sure that makes any difference, though, especially in this room. So. I guess we have to pass this thing around since we only have so many, but if you have a quick thing you really want to say, just raise it your hand, and I'll throw this thing at you. Well, I think the first question I had up was, um, what are your general thoughts on education and an education for actually um, giving people information security skills. And I know we all have different experiences because we all come from, uh, well, some of us at least come from different universities, a few of us share ones. And I have a bit of a view that a lot of programs aren't going to be necessarily well equipped for preparing people for the outside world. Certain, certain, acad uh, certain academic things like encryption, math hardcore mathematics, yes. Actual real skills, maybe not so much because a lot of these people haven't necessarily worked in the outside world. You're an exception, but a lot of people who actually have worked. A job outside of academia. Yes, you have. But some people have not, who teach classes, and some of them um, have no. How did this work? I had to explain what a USB hub was to someone once, and define pen tester to two of my professors. That was a bit disturbing, um, and uh, I think one of the reasons for this is a lot of us who actually work in the industry don't have doctorates. And without getting a tenure track position, it's really not, a, you really can't make, make much of a living being a professor unless you're tenure track. Now, some people who do get become, oh, well. Now, some people can work out tenure track. I'm not tenure track. Are oh, you not tenure track? I thought you were. Term. All right. It makes it hard to actually make a living at it unless you're tenure track. And most of these people <laughs> don't have that. And getting adjunct pay, some universities want to pay adjuncts who have a um, doctorate in psychology. The same as a master's in, that's, let's say, anything technical related. That's true of every field, though. The, the use of adjuncts cost, cuts the cost of, of education. Uh, most universities, college universities, are under a lot of pressure because states have cut funding. Uh, that's, that's, a state, that's a state legislature issue, not a higher education issue. It's a higher education issue because we have to do more with less. I understand why they do it for money reasons, but the thing is, if you can go out and make a hundred grand in the corporate world, it's kind of hard to get paid forty to go teach an adjunct class. So, so you're saying that we're not getting quality people in through higher education? In some cases, no. For us, for all the sessions, yeah. But yeah, in a lot of cases, no, I don't think we are. Well, I mean, you go back to the whole thing about, I understand where you're coming from. Your preface, you're basically, you're saying that we don't get people who understands what the heck they're doing in order to teach this because we're using people who are academics and not people with and the people skills. And people who have experience don't have the qualifications that they want to actually make a tenure track and make it something you can make a living on. Sam. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> You know, you look at history, and I'm old. I know a lot about history. Um, you know, I wasn't, I was 28 years old the day I walked into my first college class. 28. And then I went on through the whole thing. Before I went into college, my job was break things and kill people. I was in the Army. I was in the Marine Corps. I was in law enforcement. I didn't, I, I knew the operational domain of security like you don't even want to know. I spent, when I left college, I went into industry because the reason I left law enforcement to go to college was I was tired of getting shot at, stabbed, breaking bones, driving cars fast off bridges. That's a bad day. And I really decided my best thing to do is to live was to do something else. So I did IT. 
I did, I did information security, right? So going to do information security, because it's the same as physical security, right? Oh, no. <laughs> There's a lot of learning going on there. But you go back to college, that was my off-ramp from one form onto another. Now, after 25 years of doing that kind of stuff, going back into higher education, I don't know, I may have some skills, I might not have some skills. I, I, I see where you're coming from, but I would point out that the other person in my laboratory is the top person in digital forensics in the nation. One of the top guys, he's a sociologist. You know, the technical skills often are the secondary aspect to the thinking skills. And that's the thing I look at the hacker community. I'm, I'm less interested in the hackers with higher education than I am the thinking skills of the hackers coming into higher education. I don't know if I want to teach that to somebody, if I can already find the community that has that. But even even in your in your statement though you've got they have A and B so by by putting them together you're you're drawing the distinction sort of in, inherent you're 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 creating the distinction the way you say yeah, I have A and B so A and B have to be different yeah so I can I ask audience participation how many people in the audience are willing to admit that you have a college or higher, like a bachelor's or higher degree. Well, that's okay. So that's I'm going to say that's a majority. How many of everybody's hands are down now? How many people in the room are thinking of doing more, like getting another degree, at in academics in university, not tra not what we would call training, and we haven't drawn that distinction yet. But. So you're here. You actually want to know for good reason why we're talking about this, okay? Because you might spend money or something. Um, I noticed <laughs> Adrian, Adrian, when he phrased the question, talked about um, how good is a university education for acquiring skills. And I would like to ask Dr. Lyles, because we had a conversation uh, earlier where you drew a distinction between skills and two other things, I think, and it was such a canned response that I know you've given it as a lecture before. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so knowledge, skills, and abilities. So knowledge. Knowledge is those things that you acquire that are theoretical in nature. Those are the things that give you the ability to understand a problem domain. Skills are the, are the things that are uh, inherent in the activity itself. So you want to do something. I can give you the knowledge of how to drive a car, but it doesn't do you a bit if you don't have any skill to drive the car. The ability is the demonstrated capability of doing the driving. So I will assess your ability by taking you down and giving you an exam. So knowledge, skills, and abilities are not the same things, but they do not exist separate from each other. The question about education, uh, I probably own the, the youngest people in the room, and they've heard this before, so I'll go ahead and say this. A, a very, very sincere person trying to explain to me what the difference between training and education is. And, and as the father of a now 25-year-old daughter, I would say, I wanted my daughter to go get sex education because sex training was definitely off the table. And so, so, so it depends on how you were looking at things when you look at those principles of what you want them to be able to do. I can take knowledge and expand your ability and skills and, and I, I can take those three and make them better. Skills do not necessarily expand your knowledge or your adaptability to a problem set. So there is a place for all of those. And that, that ability that we actually assess is the thing that drives that. So if we give you knowledge and no skills, your abilities will not be good. That's the complaint that you actually have. If you have skills and no knowledge, you can never flex out of that, that environment. <laughs> yeah, so uh, along with that, I understand what Adrian was saying. There are those in the industry who are making really good money who are obviously not in education teaching. And there are people who are teaching who may or may not have the skill set to go out in the industry. They may have, they may have some knowledge, but not the skill set to go out in the industry. Um, I raised my hand because, yeah, I have my master's in it and I'm going for it. And the only reason I'm going for it is because most of the places around my area require the teaching credential. So if I want to go and move into Hoping not to become higher education, I have to get that credential just to go. And there's an old 
whole saying that says, go to the community, go to the community, teach. And I had an instructor in my office, I grew up a college professor, and she's like, I hate that saying. Like, but this, this industry, it's never more prevalent than the fact that those who really can do so, can be out, not even going to get education. I've got the skill set, I'm just going to go to work because you certain employer recognizes the skill set. So the question here is, and it's one of those questions, is that a piece of degree really a value? I mean, I personally think it's a value to me, not to continue learning. But I think um, to answer that specifically, uh, I think that the education, as Sam mentioned, the knowledge and abilities you gain from that. And I, I think most programs, the way they are set up, they are set up to give you a baseline set of skills. I would argue that they are mostly there to try and build strong knowledge. Um, and in some regards, abilities. Uh, I sometimes sort of conflate abilities and skills a little bit. It's, it's, it can be hard, I think, to see a distinction in the curriculum as well sometimes. Um, but I, and I think it is the education and the degree is useful. The knowledge that you gain is useful as well as some of the skills. I think the difficulty and I think what Adrian, I think what Adrian was hinting at earlier is it's not so much um, the fact that we are getting people who are teaching without the knowledge or the skills. I think it's that some of them, uh, some of our uh, professors in higher education perhaps don't understand some of the areas where they are lacking and that comes across without putting context for the skills or uh, they're very good at uh, certain very distinct areas uh, but some of them may not be the actual teaching aspect. Uh, So one of the things is, is that if you look at what goes on at the higher levels, as you move from your uh, lower level of education and you move towards the pinnacle of like a PhD, the scope changes. You go from a mile wide and an inch deep to really, really deep and very, very narrow. And that is on purpose because nobody can be an expert in everything. The next thing that happens is, is that as you move from those lower levels of education, from high school up to bachelor's degree to master's degree, you also are moving from the idea of being a consumer or being a builder to being a master of the discipline, a journeyman within the, whatever the practice is. And once again, you're narrowing the scope of the field. And you have to understand that. So you can't be an expert at everything. What happens to most professors is they are not incentivized, one, to teach. They are not incentivized. If you're in an R1, we, we call that PhD granting university, they are not incentivized to be, teach. The second thing is, is that your professors have, you have three classifications basically uh, in most of higher education. And none of the other faculty like this kind of stuff. The first classification is your hard sciences. You see that in the XKCD articles, right? The sociologists look back at the psychologists, which look back at the physicists, they, and you go over there and you end up with math, right? Well, on the other side of that equation is engineering. You know, you move from the idea of the sciences to the engineering side of things, where you're into the building, creating, and construction, right? And blowing stuff up. I like that part. And so the next part is you move even further to the usability factor out of the sciences, and then you end up with two groups. You end up with the business school, and you end up with the technology school. And the technology school is the applied sciences that do all the stuff. That's where I exist. I'm a police officer among all my other jobs, right? And so I actually do real cases in digital forensics. Now, don't, when I say police officer, I mean they give me a little tin badge and they pat me on the head and say, now do cases. And so the, uh, when you look at that process and that you have to understand, if you go to one side and you expect application, 
it ain't going to happen. If you go to the other side and you're expecting hard sciences, it ain't going to happen because there's only so many hours. There's 120 credit hours in a general bachelor's degree. There's 60 hours in the master's degree and usually 60 to 90 hours in a PhD. So that's it. And you have to get everything fit into there. And it ain't going to happen. Wait, I need, need one, one point, and then I'll, I'll send it in. Sorry. Uh, what, I understand where you're coming from, and really, you don't have, if you're a professor, you don't have the influence over the entire curriculum at the lower levels. And, you know, I teach at the undergraduate level. I don't have, I can set up. We can, we can help set up the classes you're going to take to make you a well-rounded individual. But what I teach is I try to teach my students the skills so that if they were ever to come to me for a job when I was in private industry, that I would hire them. And part of that is to make sure that they understand how to think. And part of that, too, is to make sure they have certain sets of skills. Uh, and and, and that's, that's basically what I wanted to say is, is in the end, you want to end up molding it or help, help someone find their potential or help mold someone so that once they leave, yes, knowledge is important, but yes, getting a job is important, but you sort of have to strike that balance. But we don't have a lot of control over what you're taught in English class or what you're taught in uh, a required business class, it may not jive, it may be actually different, it may not be as the same quality as you're trying to teach in your own program. So, I've been taught to teach something, or told to teach something by someone who's not qualified to tell you what to teach. Yeah, well, I mean, that's true in life. I mean, I understand where you're coming from, but life is sort of like that. You've got people who can't do it, and there's people who can do it, and you hope that you get quality. Uh, the best thing you can do if you're a consumer of higher education is try to do some research and find out where are those people who are graduating from that program, where are they getting jobs, and talk to them. You know, um, It's not just showing up on campus and reading some catalogs and making sure the campus has well lit and uh, what kind of bars they have. Uh, you have to think about what the result, begin with the end in mind, basically. Uh, but anyway, let's. So I think one of the things we run into in academia is, you know, where does InfoSec actually fit? And there's a question of, is it a discipline by itself, or is it a problem we solve with other disciplines, right? And, and that's one of the things we run into is when you talk about this, oh, I want to go to school for InfoSec, I want to go get a master's. If you look at the different schools that offer this, the curriculum varies greatly by where the department uh, you know, having the degree is housed. So if it's in a business school, it, it can be very much about risk management and policy and procedure and that sort of thing. If it's in a CS department, it can be you know all crypto all the time. Uh, if it's an IT or IS department, uh, you know maybe more hands-on practical skills. But then again, it also depends where that that lives. Where it, of yeah. But, but, you know, I, I mean, and that's one of the challenges, even if you look at IT or IS, if it's, for example, in my school, uh, I, IT and IS are their own department within the College of uh, Technology and Computing. They used to be in the business college. Um, in other schools where IS lives in, in the business school and IT lives under, you know, CS in the College of, you know, Science, things are very different. So I think that's one of the things to consider when you're looking at these programs is, you know, are they teaching the things you're interested in? I mean, if you look at one that's based in an IT department, uh, you often have a lot of hands-on stuff like you're talking about. If it's based in the CS department, depending on the school, it could be very theoretical or it could be hands-on. It really depends on the curriculum. So I, I think I, I've got a, 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 oh yeah, well, let's, okay. uh, so, so, yeah, opinions on SANS courses and the master's degree. Uh, I've taken, um, 
This is the master's degree? Oh, I, ha I don't know anything about that. I can hand it to someone who does. Uh, we'll see if we can get in trouble with that. I was going to say the SANS courses I've had have been pretty good. But uh, I'll let you. Oh, can you? I'll make you use Here, but then what you build. <laughs> so will you, will you rephrase the question so I can make sure that I don't answer what you didn't ask and get myself in trouble? Well, let me let me actually turn it over to these guys. I mean, I I'm sort of an insider. I'll I'll tell you what I think. Yeah, right. I have no I do too. I have no <laughs> so uh, I've audited two of the SANS courses. I have audited GRIM and the GCIH uh, valuation courses, and uh, I currently have two in my queue to take uh, on the distance learning options. So this is what I'd call informed. Uh, knowledge about it. I'd say that from my perspective, they are awesome. I love the instructors. I love the stuff that they give out. I just spent some time with Lenny Zeltzer out in uh, California. Ed Scotus, I've talked to him many, many times. So I've got an idea who these guys are. These are very applied. They are tool-centric, non-concept-based, and incredibly applied, which plays directly into the kind of things that I like. My friends over in the CS department hate them. They say they are not education, and they specifically use the T word, training, to deal with them. Now, I don't, yeah, I, I think that there's a space for that. And I would point out that the US military, which I used to represent, uses them extensively. They're the only training education environment currently that I know of as a sole source contract of the US military. So I, I question to sort of follow up um, based on when you talked about knowledge skills and abilities and the combination of those together where do you think the SANS courses then fit in say um, maybe as continuing education would they be of the same would they hit that trifecta or are they really good if someone is specifically looking for one or two of the of that you know triad so my, my opinion on it is is that going in with a PhD in digital forensics and taking some of these courses, uh, having taken all the serious courses, which are all theoretic heavy, I don't need a lot of the theory. I've pretty much got it. So, <clears throat> but if I was to be hiring somebody from a SANS course, they're not the person that I would be moving into management. Now think about that. Because they're not going to have the breadth. Now, would they have the skills? Yes, they have the skills to do the job. I like that. But are they the person I move into management? It'd be really dependent on what their other skill sets were they brought to the table. And so th there's that knowledge is missing. Uh, I've got a couple of SAN certifications. I've got the GXPN, the GPEN, uh, the GCIH. Uh, I'm, I'm just finishing up the uh, 503 course. Uh, and I'm going to take that test in the next couple of weeks. So I've got quite a bit of experience with the SANS courses. I've done both the uh, live courses and the on-demand, and I, they're very good. I mean, they're, they're expensive, as you, you certainly know, but I mean, it's very structured training. It's, uh, I mean, just I'll, I'll say training, because it really is. It's very training, but it's very structured. Um, it's very focused on, you know, w walking you through things, but it's, it's you know, it's high-quality training. Uh, I can't really speak to their master's program, although their master's program is extensively made up of these courses, so, uh, yes. Yes, and, and I'm not familiar with the details of those, so. Yeah. I do. I would like to, after we get done with this, I would like to point out. Let me get this real quick. I like to point out there's other kinds of training. There's other kinds of training besides SANS. Uh, I'm a big fan of the offset training. Uh, I'm an OSCP. I think it was worth every penny and every blood, sweat, and tear I spent on it. Uh, there's also uh, Try Harder, that's right. Uh, I learned a lot, and it's very much hands-on. There's also Coreland stuff, the exploit uh, development stuff through Coreland. And those aren't particularly education, but they are training. So somebody 
who has, you know, I come from a liberal arts background. I think liberal arts definitely teaches you how to think. But beyond, what is that? <laughs> but beyond that, if you have a liberal arts background, uh, you don't, you know, I'm of the opinion you don't always have to have a degree in order to get a job in information security. But it helps to have a degree, and it also helps to have a skill set. And that's all I wanted to say is there's things beyond SANS. And I don't have any experience with SANS, but... I I do, I was going to say, when I said I have no opinion, I have no opinion about yeah. the master's program, because I don't know much about it. I do, I, I did like the two SANS courses I took, though. Right. Okay, so, uh, there are questions out there I know, but I claim last word on the SANS program, because I, you know, kind of helped organize the curriculum. We, uh, it is heavily based on SANS classes, but you're right. There's a lot of paper writing, and that was done, there was much gnashing of teeth and wringing of hands about that, because nobody likes to write papers. And, uh, right, that too. But being able to write a paper gets at some of the things that are beyond skills. It gets at the, the ability to, to think critically, to organize your thoughts, the kind of things that we're talking about up here as education beyond skills. And so what we tried to do with the SANS curriculum, and I'm no longer the Dean of Academic Affairs there, so I can speak as an outsider. I have also paid quite a lot of my own personal money to take SANS classes. Um, the, the master's degree, I, I think, has a really good combination of the very deep skill set, as well as the requirement to think broadly and to think about uh, the, the broader implications of some of the skills that you develop. And if you're interested, uh, there is a SANS reading room. If you, you can go out on the website, you can find it. Look at some of the papers that are written. So that gives you an idea of some of the research that those st students are doing. Uh, so I don't, I don't get anything for saying that it's a matter of personal pride that I was involved in the accreditation. But, you know, I'm sure there are other educational institutions that are just as good. I don't know of them, but I'm, you know, I'm sure they're there. Marshall. Well, oh, it's, except for Mar <laughs> Marshall and Purdue, of course. So somebody, yeah, you had the guy, that, uh, Radis. Radis, so, you're in the front. Yeah. Question. Going back to what Bill was saying a minute ago about he's trying to make sure it's a good This is going to be a long question. Um, going back a, few, a couple minutes ago, what Bill was saying, he wants to make sure the people he's teaching have certain skill sets and an ability to go out and get a job. Going back to what Sam was talking about earlier about knowledge and whatnot, are you guys seeing the, the driving committees so where I, where I go to school, we have driving committees from, from the industry pushing certain things. Are you seeing the driving committees working against each other or with each other in the re different regions? So everybody has like a, a similar training set and you have something that's unified when you say information security or is it completely whatever stuck to the wall that day? What do you mean by region? Uh, just to well, wait, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, Regional, like, in Michigan you have the big three pushing what they want to see colleges teaching. Okay. Um, I don't know what, I, I'm assuming in New York it's mostly business, I'm assuming, I, I don't know what they teach in Indiana, I'm sorry. So I am unaware of large amounts of cooperation between Purdue and IU on InfoSec curriculum development. I know, unless we're both hitting the NSA Center of Excellence, um, that could be one. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if, I, I mean, you, uh, being more into things, you could speak more on if we have push, pushes from above, but I, I don't get that sense of IU. 2005, 2006, Purdue hosted uh, boot camps for all of the faculty across the United States uh, through the CAE accreditation, Center of Academic Excellence accreditation program. Uh, 85 faculty, I think, went through the uh, program, and that was all about trying to bring the curriculums into alignment. So IU attended, Eastern Michigan sent people, there was, there was people from all over the country. I mean, it was a, a wonderful thing. I was one of the faculty that actually went through that program. And uh, that was really about trying to centralize and create a repository. Currently, there are a set of initiatives through NSF that do pretty much the same thing. However, the, it always comes back to the same standards. The TSI 4011 standard is a standard CAE accreditation, now 4016 or whatever it is, um, or 4021. I can't remember which it is now. And uh, those kind of accreditation guidelines set the baselines. 
There's also the secondary one, which is what we kind of touched on, which is that you have ABET accreditation, engineering and technology accreditation. Then you have the ASCB, whatever it is, business, I can't remember what it's called, the, the business accreditation guidelines. Those set external requirements on what get taught within the curriculums. And they're not nice to each other. They don't work well at the same place, same time, because of the requirements. And then you have OPM requirements if you want to work for government, which drives the industrial military complex we mentioned a second ago, because it requires things like, uh, you know, you have to have calculus, you know, expanded calculus, not just the basic calculus. You have to have a series of things like electromagnetic wave theory, which doesn't get taught in the business school. So there's those kind of requirements get drove down, which completely change their curriculums in ways you wouldn't expect. Now, that may be part of the reason why we have different names for each person's program. I also want to know how often, and we can maybe roll this in some other questions, how often does someone just, as a school, decide, I'm going to teach some kind of information security program just because they know it sounds semi-sexy and there's jobs out there and people want to take degrees? I was wondering how many people get into it without necessarily having the backgrounds to actually be able to offer a degree. It takes an awful long time to get a course offered. You don't just think of it and say, we're going to teach this next yeah. quarter. There's a process. And there's also usually state requirements on top. Like if you get teaching in Michigan, they have Michigan higher education, all those So, so, so I, I can talk about this because I've actually been working on a graduate certificate in cybersecurity. Uh, I've had a, a federal grant that we're now uh, almost out with our second year. Um, and going through the approvals to uh, the approvals to add the classes, get the uh, certificate approved through the uh, the local college, the university, the board of regents, and the regional accreditation board is still going and has been going for months and months. Uh, I, I think I I submitted the first draft of this last uh, October, uh, and we're we're hoping to have everything wrapped up and ready to offer uh, for spring, um, but we're still waiting for that accreditation to uh, come through. So it, it's a long process, and even, even just creating a course uh, takes, uh, at least in my institution, it's a, it's a minimum of six months if you want to get something added to the catalog and get it fast-tracked. So, um, but as far as just creating something because they want to teach it, I, I, I don't think that that happens often because I think that a lot of people who are, are teaching things are passionate about what they're doing. It goes back to the PhD thing you're talking about. And uh, have you all seen Matt Mike's uh, PhD comic? It's the one where the little the, you know line expanding makes a little dimple, right? And so, so I think a lot of people are kind of in their own world. I know that we have a, a, some IT faculty who don't necessarily see the interplay between uh, InfoSec and you know cabling and subnetting and things like that. And one of the challenges I have is trying to make it so information security is not a course. It's a concept that's organic to various courses. And, and you know, it comes up in their, their database course. It comes up in their networking course. It comes up in the Linux admin course. Um, and, and so, you know, I know that's going a little beyond, but there's a lot of, you know, things to making curriculum changes. Uh, and it, it takes a while. Thank you. Thank you there. Don't open the mic. So far, we've done a lot between training and education, but how about splitting education a little bit? We have some places that are study, and you do a lot of thesis, and then you have other universities that are very research centric. Within InfoSec, do you see either pros or cons? Or is that going to be if you're planning on going towards your PhD more, or if you're trying to get out into the real world a little bit? So I, I created this. Uh, so uh, th there's this like th you have the creators, you have the innovators, and you have the operators. That's the way I explain it to people. And a lot of times, we're mostly most of the people in information security, we're running around in the operator mode. We just want to make it work and not leak. You know, we want the boat to keep, keep, keep afloat, right? The innovators are the ones out there that are coming basically out of the research environment. And what they're doing is they're taking something and they're moving it down the road a little further. They're, they just want to make it a little bit better. That's all they really want to do. And then, no higher education required. There's some guy in a garage somewhere, doesn't know that he can't do something, and he goes and does it. And that creator is coming up with a new computer, a new way of doing something, because they're breaking all the rules. And so in higher education, as something becomes a discipline, it, it really gets nailed down to 
less and less innovative. It's less and less and much more about just the next step and just the next, and the steps get shallower. You know, if you look at over in certain disciplines, they haven't moved forward in 40, 50, 60 years. They're still where they were back whenever, you know. But there's somebody out in the garage maybe that's going to come up with something nobody's seen before. So think about it more that way. What we see in higher education is that as you go towards the applied side, my side of the, the science equation, we're not really doing the research you think. We are technologists. And so as a technologist, my job is to make it better, make the processes better, think about it in a new way, adapt the tools. I'm interested in tools. I do work with tools. That's what I do as a technologist. And over in the sciences, they're creating new instrumentality, they're creating new methods of thinking of stuff, whatever. But my, my work is about the applied side of things. And so in my PhD students, when they come to me with something, they say, I want to create a new crypto algorithm. I say, go to computer science. Um, if they come to me and say, I've got a new technique of doing information security, then that's something brand new. I, I think that's a really good point. Uh, for example, at Indiana University for our master's program, uh, the computer science side for master's has a thesis and it's a pretty, you, it can be a very traditional research process where uh, th that would be great for preparing you if you continued on. Now, the informatics side, uh, if I recall correctly, has mainly an internship requirement. It's very project-based and then you get an internship. And I think there are certain benefits to both. Now, if you were going to go out and work, uh, because of the fact that our, this specific university, IU, the research tends to be more theoretical, it might not have the same general applicability as um, when Sam's helping um, his students with some research where if you're applying new techniques, where to me that is very useful if you're going out into industry. You have to understand that I am giving my perspective on some of this stuff. Because if you go, we're an R1, which in the research means we're a PhD granting, primarily research based. And when I do research, it's completely different than my fellow faculty. I go out and do research, I go to a company and I help them do better. Uh, the difference between me and a consultant is I get paid less. I was just going to say that though you want to, you want people to care more about the teaching and less about their own research, you may want to look for a university that isn't as big on research because I've seen some professors spend all the time on their research and hardly any of it actually teaching the students. So, so I was going to say, uh, my, my school is is not an R1 university. That's the University of Utah that does that and, and, and does all the fancy research. We are a teaching university, and so our focus is on teaching. And uh, one of the things we try to do is prepare our graduates to be able to go into the workforce directly. And so we, we have an advisory board uh, with a lot of the local employers, including some national companies and some uh, three-letter agencies and things like that that are in the area. And we talk to them about what they're looking for. Um, and that's what drives a lot of our curriculum. Um, interestingly, when I ask people what they want the students to know, the first thing they say is whatever you know, technology or pain or you know, whatever they're into right now. The second thing, almost invariably, is business savvy and communication skills, which is something no one ever wants to learn because they say, oh, we're IT people, we'll just have the computer run off a report. But uh, you know, that's one of the things that you know, we hope to instill in students as well. Uh, when I get passionate about something, I want to make a point. Like philosophers and computer scientists dying with professors. Yeah. So w what I wanted to say is that you can be a you can do both. You can really do research and teaching. We are, Marshall is a teaching institution, and to be well rounded, you really need be need to be doing research. So uh, this is my second end of my fourth semester at Marshall University. Um, last summer, we actually came up with a research, got a grant, and we're presenting it here at DerbyCon because we wanted to work on something that was useful to the community. Open source, we could release it at DerbyCon, and of course, I don't see the students here, so hopefully they're not out drinking somewhere. But uh, you can do both, but I would say that it's up to what you want in life. If you want 
a really highly academic program, go to a highly academic program. If you want some place, it's a teaching university and you have small classes, Marshall's an excellent example of that. Uh, we've just, uh, we're going to roll out a, uh, a undergraduate certificate in information assurance. And about the question about what's information assurance and what's information security, it's basically the same thing. You've got government words, you've got, you mean, what's cyber security? Drink. You know, so you're really having these sort of discussions about basically the same thing, but a lot of it's marketing, some of it's paradigm. If you want to, uh, Jesus. Back in the 90s, you couldn't say what's doing. But it depends on what you want to defend yourself to prepare yourself to do. If you want to work in government, you have to call it information assurance. So anyway, it's a long story, but I think that I now can be confused myself to the point. So we'll. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Um, I also I teach at uh, Columbus State Community College in Columbus as an undergraduate, and I'm also working on a master's program at Wright State. So I'm kind of on both sides of the coin. Um, but that's a great question about the thesis stuff. Um, I think their program, the Wright program at Wright State, is a little bit about um, teaching and research somewhere in the in the middle. Um, so the question that I have is, uh, as a uh, professor or someone teaching uh, students, what what advice would you give to say how can we get them both the skills and the knowledge that they need? I'd say that uh, the in your specific field, if you're teaching digital forensics and information insurance such as I am, you make sure that they have those skills, but they also have to have the requirement to become well-rounded individuals by taking things such as math, science, uh, literature, make sure they can read and write, critically think, all that sort of thing. So whenever we, you know, at Marshall that's what we try to do. It's a liberal arts college generally and uh, we're trying to, to build the well-rounded renaissance person as well as to give them specific skills. So. That's one. Uh, you're not thinking of doing this in a single lifetime, right? No. I mean, that's there. You go because it's it's very very difficult to do, and a lot of it depends on the student. Because if one of the things I would say is that if you're going to, if you're thinking of getting an advanced degree so you can get a better job, then you're doing it wrong. Um, you should, I. In my humble, not so humble opinion, if you're going to spend all that time in your life, it ought to be something more than making more money, um, because you can get so much more out of the education. But you, it, it is this is the challenge that we as educators deal with all the time: is how do we pick what is the we have limited time, so how do we pick what's most important? And you see it in the press even. You know, the education budgets are being cut, so we're going to cut the arts program. Right, and because everybody knows that arts don't actually teach anything important, don't don't throw anything. I'm all for arts programs, right? Uh, yes, yeah, 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 exactly. Don't tweet, please don't tweet that. Yeah. The arts don't teach anything important. So anyway, it's a, it's a very good question, and I think if you can instill the love of learning, uh, and that means good professors, and it means good good students, your, your admission requirements can do part of that. So I heard a, another part to that question, which is how do you get knowledge and skills to be combined? And there's some very inside the academic kind of environment, I would say. Problem-based learning. Everything has to be based on problems. Give the students open-ended problems, make them work the problems, and don't give them the solutions. They learn much more from not solving the problem than they do from solving the problem. Second, give them scenario-based learning, give them real real and sometimes grand challenges because those kind of things always drive the thinking and mindset for problem solving. So those are how my labs are set up. The first semester that students get those kind of labs, they usually cry a lot, drink a lot, and uh, 
I'm okay with that, uh, as long as I show up fairly sober. Um, and then the next thing that happens is, is that if people from, that are following them in their first semester of getting that kind of educational environment, they will be mean to them. They'll say, well, you've got to up your game. You've got to be better. You've got to do things. But the payoff for me as a professor is when they get the job and they end up being whoever hired them's boss fairly rapidly because they can think outside the box, they can think, they can work their problem, and they're technically talented. Uh, so in, in the broad sense, uh, as, as they said, you've got to instill a love of learning. Have them try and encourage them to go to events like DerbyCon where you will mix with people and if you're a more theoretical person, you will understand the importance and the usefulness of skills and you will pick up skills uh, from those you meet there. In particular, as Sam uh, was talking sort of his method, I, I found that one of the most successful courses I think we had, uh, which was a systems, uh, a sort of system security course, where you would have lectures during the week, a couple lectures giving you knowledge foundations. And then the labs will build off of those knowledge foundations to give you a problem-based learning environment with open-ended problems. And I think uh, that was sort of one of the first times I think the happiest thing to me was when students would come to ask questions about lab. They weren't, well, how do I do this? It was more, this is the idea we have. We don't really have the skills right now to set this up. Could you please point us in the right direction for us to look and try and build on these skills? I think I'm just going to echo what, what the others have said. Uh, one thing we talk about uh, at my university a lot is engaged learning, where the students are actively involved in things. And so I think a, a combination of, of that problem solving or engagement and then also passion uh, has a lot to do with it. So if you've got uh, professors who are passionate and can you know, provide, you know, show the students kind of the way to do things and you know, the way to work through those problems, um, and basically kind of share some of that passion. I think that's uh, really powerful. I also think gamification is going to be a big thing as, as far as getting, uh, you know, the, the skills and abilities up because people love to do games. I know some people mentioned the offensive security uh, stuff. I mean, when you're, you're working through those boxes um, and you're kind of blind, you know, you get that rush of when you solve that, that thing. And I think the gamification aspect is going to be um, pretty big. And I, I try to work that into uh, my courses when I can is to give the students, uh, you know, some kind of involvement basically and, and, you know, make them feel something about what they're doing. They're not just mechanically, yeah. So I, the final I, I gave at the end of the summer semester, uh, three of the questions were just Wireshark captures, uh, you know, just PCAPs, and the question says, L review PCAP, you know, one, what's happening? So, so you know, very, very, very hands-on, you, you know, actual, not, not answering test questions, actually digging into a PCAP. I think we're about out of time. Yeah. Uh, thank you much. I, oh, oh, great. All right, you make it really fast because I got to get Moe up on the stage. Uh, I'd just like to add on um, to the excellent answers given by the panel there. Uh, another thing that you can suggest your students do is internships and co-ops. Uh, getting them involved in industry while they're still in academia really helps them get both the skills and the knowledge set. And then also if you have influence on a senior project of any kind, an excellent open-ended senior project that's really rigorous will do them a world of favors where they can go to an interview and say, I demonstrated a working project at the end of the semester. All right, I'm going to help him hook his laptop up. Who wants the last wood? Bill. <laughs> Cyber. 
Uh, no. <laughs> it's half a word.